Wow, well, good morning. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you today, particularly if you are brand new here. We don't do this every week. <laughs> this is why once a year uh, we have a special celebration of our diversity of a church of 65 different nations right now here at CLM, for which we thank God. And you're extremely welcome, whatever your background ethnicity today. Um, but if this is a bit of a shock to your system, uh, this is a special celebration that you have come to. So you've timed it well. I do want to encourage everybody to be here and bring a friend if you can. Next Sunday here at Central, we've got Pastor Eve Mungai, who is the executive pastor of ICC Nairobi, Kenya, going to be here preaching for us. She's, uh, she's married to Pastor Philip Mungai, who was our host uh, when we were in Kenya in February. And they are an extraordinary couple. Uh, Philip Mungai uh, is the right-hand man to Bishop Philip Kototu, who heads up Assemblies of God for Kenya. And uh, Eve is a great teacher of the Word. So come next Sunday, be a part of that. And uh, it will be an amazing time. Well, as we said, we're here to celebrate all nations. And at the end of today's service, there will be mondazis, puff puff, samosa, and cookies. So uh, a spread, a spread across our nationality. Some people are asking me, where are you from today, Pastor? <laughs> I, I, I want to make it clear. I was born in Ireland. I grew up in England. I am wearing Nigerian. I, I, was, I was most recently in Kenya. My family are English, but I am part of a global family of brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And my citizenship isn't here anyway, it's in heaven. I just thought I'd get that out of the way. If my British brothers and sisters feel sold out today, I'll be back in British next Sunday. So I listen, if, if I'm not going to wear this today. I would have worn an England shirt if I had one, but... Given the last three games, I did not feel inspired to go out and buy one. I do hope that's going to turn around later on today. I remember learning a lesson in my very first All Nations celebration uh, about 12 years ago when Esther, myself and the children had just come here to Coventry. And uh, an African brother who is still part of the church who will remain nameless uh, wore what some would call a Rasta hat which is a Nigerian colored hat with dreadlocks sewn in. And in a moment's madness, I tried it on. And uh, something happened, it's like the paparazzi. Cameras came out of nowhere. And before I could process what was happening, I was on Facebook going viral. So I, I have learned you have to be careful and considered in these moments. I do want to say I humbly apologize to anyone who was or is offended. Uh, there's a true saying that you live and learn. And to all nations, all cultures, all ethnicities, the greatest respect and love today. You know, it's so rich to be part of a diverse community. Let me say it again, it's so rich to be part of a diverse community. As I've already said, we have registered here on our database 2024, 65 different nationalities. Something that Esther and myself treasure and rejoice in. It's what home has become to look like for us. And I continue to learn so much, including some better ways to do life than the culture that I grew up in. And hear me right, because in the right sense, I am proud to be British. And there are a lot of great things in my heritage. But also in, in learning from many others, I have learned some amazing ways of doing life. The reality is that my prayer life has been strengthened in the presence of Nigerian, Ken Kenyan, Malawian, Zimbabwean, and other African brothers and sisters. When I, should I go home to be with the Lord before he returns? I'm really hoping for a West Indian funeral. Because there's no better way than hundreds of people gathered around your grave backfilling while singing the songs of eternal glory. I... I I have learned what it is to honor inside a family from many of my Asian brothers and sisters. I've been inspired in my faith by a Singaporean mentor. And if I don't name check your culture, the point is I'm proud in the right sense to be from where I'm from. But being part of a family of nations, you get to learn more and it's richer and it grows you. 
I'm a bigger person and I'm not just talking about jollof rice. <laughs> but to be in a culturally diverse setting and to do well requires from us all greater effort and greater intelligence and greater adaptability and at times greater grace, but it brings us closer to the heart of God, whose heart has always been for all nations. Often when we share with other people from different places around the world that we have 65 nations in our church, they're astonished because it's, it's not normal. And some of it is to do with the diversity of the culture in the United Kingdom that enables that to be so. And often what they say to us is, it must be like a foretaste of heaven. And of course, in a sense, it is. As we've already heard, as Esther read to us, Revelation 7 says this, After I looked, there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried in a loud voice. Can we say this together? Is it coming on the screen? Revelation 7. Oh, I don't know. Can you track here where it breaks in halfway through? Salvation belongs. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The title of my message today is, It's Always Been All Nations. It's always been all nations. You, you might be familiar with the sitcom Friends. Uh, many of you will be. There are six main characters, three guys and three girls, and they live in two flats and they're opposite each other. And this, uh, there's this on-off romance between two characters, Ross and Rachel. And in one long-awaited episode with their on-off relationship, Ross declares his love for Rachel by saying, It's always been you, Rachel. And it's a favorite among friends, fans. And I want us to understand that in the heart of God, it's always been all nations. He's never been fickle or unfaithful. But it's not simply where we get to in Revelation. It's always been all nations. It's not that God decided to extend the invitation to more than Israel in the New Testament. He created the peoples of the earth. He has always loved all peoples of the earth. He has always desired all nations. He's it's his heartbeat and his great passion. You know, the Bible uses different words. Sometimes it is all nations. Sometimes it's peoples. The UN states there are currently 195 recognized countries in the world. But there are thousands of people groups. The numbers vary depending whether language and dialect only are considered or also links to acceptance. But to give you an idea, the Joshua Project a Christian organization looking to outwork the Great Commission identifies 17,446 different people groups in the earth. Which is why I love the, the language of Revelation that we just read, which is mirrored earlier, two chapters in Revelation 5, where it says they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood, Jesus, you purchased for God persons from... Can we say this together? Every tribe and language and people and nation. Again, every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. However you classify it, tribe, people, language, nations, God's heart has been for all. So we're going to take a whistle-stop tour through the scriptures this morning. Tracking all the way back to Genesis, the first 11 chapters are really setting the scene before Abraham, who, who God calls to be, if you like, the father of this family, the Jewish people, Israel, that he was creating. But right at this moment, at the start of Genesis 12, where the story of redemption starts to unfold before us, God says to him, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth 
will be blessed through you. God's heart right at the beginning was on all peoples. Can we say all peoples? All people. This is God's heart. It's always been all nations. The root word here really means family or tribe. It means all families, all tribes will be blessed through you. The blessing of the promise is passed from Abraham to Isaac and then to Jacob and Jacob's offspring. And towards the end of the book of Genesis, we find Joseph who goes to Egypt. And, uh, and there there is redemption for the nation of Egypt that comes through the descendant of Abraham. Another nation is blessed through the one that God has blessed. And then obviously in time, Israel move out of Egypt, rescued by the Lord. We get to Exodus. And we think, don't we, that Israel alone came out of Egypt. But the Bible says in Exodus 12, 38, many other peoples went up with them. A literal translation is a mixed multitude. As Moses led God's people into deliverance and freedom, many others went with them enjoying the blessing of God. Of course, the Old Testament largely focuses on Israel. But let's not fail to see God's provision even there for other nations among them. No other nation at that time was making provision for other nations. But God brings a word to Israel. He says, for example, in Leviticus chapter 19, 33 to 34, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Others are made welcome. Treat them as yourself. Love them as yourself. This is the heart of God. It's always been all nations. As the Old Testament progresses, we see a number of what we might consider to be outsiders being written into God's story. Rahab, the inhabitant of Jericho. Ruth, a Moabite woman who became the grandmother of King, the great grandmother of King David, the ancestor of Joseph, who was married to Mary, the, the man who acted as an earthly father to Jesus. And Rahab and Ruth are name checked, get this, in Matthew chapter 1, right at the beginning of the New Testament. Those that are outside are brought inside. We see God using. Obedidim, the non-Hebrew in the time of David, his whole household being blessed. These little indicators, these little signposts. God speaks through the prophets. Isaiah 56 saying this, And foreigners, all of us who are non-Jewish, probably the vast majority of us here gathered today, who bind themselves to the Lord, who minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And we know that phrase because Jesus rehearses it in the temple when he, he clears the traders out. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exile of us exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. And then in Jesus' ministry, mainly to the Jewish people of Israel, but he keeps reaching out, doesn't he? Don't you find it fascinating that he is endorsed and worshipped by Magi who came from the east, revealed to them that the Savior was coming, non-Jews coming to pay their tribute, to bow down in worship, his coming is heralded by those outside of Israel. Jesus in his ministry, healing the demon-possessed man, where there was a herd of pigs, clearly in a non-Jewish area, healing the Greek Syrophoenician woman, the Roman centurion servant. But when we get to the resurrection, when Jesus is no longer speaking in parables or hiding his identity, we get to Matthew 28, the so-called Great Commission, and he says this, these famous words that will be familiar to most of us. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. It's the vision. 
It's the mission. All nations. It's always been all nations. And the reaching with the message of Jesus is specifically to all nations. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the final recorded words of King Jesus before he ascends to the Father. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In the next chapter, the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. And we see the 120 that are gathered, speaking in tongues, proclaiming praises in many languages. Let's read the account of this. This is Acts 2, 6 to 12. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. <clears throat> Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Well, I tell you, in part, it means that God's heart is for all peoples. The Spirit is poured out, and they are all speaking in different languages. And all the people that are there are hearing the praises of God. The church is birthed. And the covenant kicks in. And, and how is it announced? With the Spirit poured out on all flesh, with nations of all languages or many languages. Of course, it takes a little while for the penny to drop to the f followers of Jesus. And God allows persecution, causing the gospel to spread and to expand. And, and going out beyond Jerusalem and going out beyond Israel. The baptism of the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10. The, the scattering of the believers from Acts 8 onwards. And by the time we get to Acts 13, just 18 years after the resurrection, we see what becomes a pivotal apostolic church in the city of Antioch in modern day Turkey. Not only in Gentile territory, but moreover with an ethnically diverse leadership team sending out missionaries into the earth. It's exactly where Pastor Kirk McAteer was at the start of this month. I wonder if we could go to Acts 13, verse 1, uh, and onwards it says, Now at the church in Antioch there were prophets and teachers Barnabas. Barnabas was a Jewish European. Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. These were both black African men. Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. He was understood to be from Western Asia. Saul, who was a, Tur a, a, a Turkish Jew. A multicultural, diverse team of leaders and believers. And the Bible says, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, functioning together, praying Together, leading together, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Out from Antioch, the world began to be reached. And the nations have continued to be reached. Before Christ returns, Paul states in Galatians 3, 28, 29, There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, he says, then you are Abraham's seed. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. If we think all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 on the promise, if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed, the Bible tells us, and heirs according to the promise. What is the promise of Abraham? It is to be a blessing even to the nations. And so in Christ, we find ourselves blessed to be a blessing to the nations. And then we end with Revelation where we've already been, with this great multitude before the throne. And that is where we will be, my brothers and sisters. If you are a brother or a sister in Christ, we will be part of that great multitude. Saints from all the nations and peoples and tribes and languages. It's always been all nations. This is the very heart of God.
So what does it mean for us? Well, it's, I love taking a, uh, like a journey through the, through the Bible like that to see the big overview. But where does it bite? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for us? Well, I'd like to suggest three things for us today. Number one, there is strength in diversity. Let's move towards it. It's God's design, not, not to keep everybody separate now and then together in heaven. The kingdom prayer is on earth as it is in heaven. So if in heaven there's going to be a great multitude together united, then on earth is a great multitude gathered united, which means that we move towards diversity. We find this great strength in diversity. I've already talked about how my life is being enriched as I learn more than just the, the narrowness of my own culture and experience. And we see in the Bible the lens of the book of Acts really beginning to move away to some degree at least from Jerusalem and on to Antioch and the sending work of that Antioch diverse house. There is strength in diversity. The world recognizes it too. The benefits of cross-cultural collaborative working, richness, diversity, capacity are becoming increasingly well documented. McKinsey and Co., the consulting organization with global partners, has been tracking the correlation between leadership diversity and financial performance and holistic impacts over the last decade. They published a number of reports. A recent report from December 2023 entitled Diversity Matters Even More. They found that leadership diversity is convincingly associated with holistic growth ambitions, greater social impact, and more satisfied workforces. In their most recent study, they looked at 1,265 companies across 23 countries and six global regions, considering financial performance and holistic impact. They found that companies with diverse leadership teams continue to be associated with higher financial returns. Diversity in executive teams of both ethnicity and gender appear to show an increased likelihood of above average profitability. They concluded that despite a challenging business environment, the business case for diverse leadership teams is clear and growing stronger. Their findings show that statistically there is a significant link between diverse boards and executive teams and higher holistic impact scores including on environment and social measures. I want to say it's not a surprise because it's God's idea. It's God's plan. It's God's heart. So how do we move towards diversity? Well, it means more than simply attending a church that has different nations expressed. It means moving towards one another and particularly those who are not like we are. The reality is in our fallen state, we're fearful creatures who tend to gravitate to people like us, right? It's easier. It's simpler. We understand one another without even trying. But we could stretch ourselves and move with humility and desire to learn. In Christ, being transformed and capturing God's heart for others. Going beyond, to use Pastor Kirk's language, moving out of the comfort zone and into the commission zone. So we learned in our invited series in the autumn of 2022. And if you've joined us since then, would really encourage you to go on our YouTube channel and, and catch at least some of the amazing testimonies from people here at CLM. And, and you'll see that most people's story is not as simple as you think it might be. It means us making an effort. I remember arriving here for a meeting. It was a ministry meeting in an evening in my first year that we were here in Coventry. I was one of the first two or three people to arrive, and the, the meeting was for about 30 different people. And uh, I remember putting my Bible and my jacket down on a particular seat. There were four different tables set out, and then I left my stuff there, and I, uh, and I went to greet people, and I got into conversation, and, and I was there as pretty much everybody arrived. And then I turned around to see that where my Bible was, there was a table of entirely white people, and another table of entirely white people, and two tables of entirely black people. And I went over to the group of white people where my stuff was and I said, uh, please uh, don't be offended by this, but I need to move. And I went and I took my stuff and I sat on a different table. We've got to make an effort to move towards others. And it's so rich. It will grow us. It will stretch us. 
on earth as it is in heaven. Secondly, there's blessing in unity. Let's fiercely guard it. You know, diversity is one thing. It's so important. To move towards it means inclusion and belonging, welcome, hospitality, and very other Christian ideas. But unity is something else. It involves love and alignment and relational health. And it carries and it releases a blessing. Unity carries and releases a blessing. Jesus prayed for unity, that we may be one, even as he and the Father are one. Psalm 133, New King James says this, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The blessing flows where there is unity. Here in the house, let's fiercely guard it. Let's go after it. Let's prize it. Let's protect it. And among other churches, if we need to, let's fight for it. It means keeping short accounts with one another. It means extending grace. It means resolving relational conflict and challenge readily and with humility in a biblical way. Beginning with Matthew 18, 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out your fault just between the two of you. That's the starting place. To seek reconciliation wherever possible. It means dwelling together, actually moving closer to one another, being in Christ-centered community, expressed so well here in our life groups. And praying together. Nothing joins your heart with someone else quite like praying together. Christ in the middle. Can I invite you, if this morning you're on the edge of church, maybe you're brand new and you've just come in, but if you've settled here, but you're still on the edge, take a step in. Take a step into Christ-centered community. Be part of the family of God. Don't visit. Belong. Get into a life group. Come to our newcomers evening in a couple of weeks' time, at least as a start to meet some of the team and to find easy ways that you can connect. And also means us being open to growing in our understanding. Esther and Tracy did some brilliant cultural awareness training for us as a staff recently and, and majored on some work from Erin Mayer's brilliant book, Culture Map, where she identifies eight different scales, how different cultures tend to operate on matters of communication and evaluation, persuasion, leadership, decision-making, trust, disagreement, and scheduling. It's a massive eye-opener to realize that the way you were brought up is not the only way to do life. And in different cultures, some things that mean one thing in your culture mean something in a different culture. But if we educate ourselves, we understand one another better, and then we flow together, and unity is strengthened the way unity is strengthened, a blessing is commanded. And thirdly, Joshua, why don't you come? There's a world to reach. Let's do it. Let's do it. God's heart has always been for all nations. It's always been all nations. And it means us reaching out. You know God is moving in the earth? Did you know God is moving in the earth? I want to tell you, God is moving across the earth. Sometimes we only see what we're in. We maybe come to church on a Sunday and think this is it. Let me tell you, God is moving across the world. Think of the hundred million brothers and sisters in the country of China. Not that long ago, there was a tiny seed of a church hiding underground, fiercely persecuted. God has moved in exponential ways. In Indonesia, the most populous Muslim nation in the world, there are now 20 million Christians and growing. In Mongolia, in 1990, as it came out of communism, there were no known Christians at all. Now there are 60,000 followers of Christ. But get this, that in 2010, just 20 years after they came out of communism, the Mongolians were sending more missionaries overseas per Christian than any other nation in the world. God is on the move. In Iran, where it is forbidden to convert to Christianity, there are now estimated 6 million believers. 
the fastest growing church in the world. And if you look at a map of the world, you see where Iran is. Right in the center of so many other pivotal nations. And God is at work. A church hidden underground, six million. Three weeks ago, a young lady from Iran, an asylum seeker into the UK, she just arrived three weeks earlier into the United Kingdom, a Christian young lady. And she's been transported by the border agents, relocated up to Coventry. She finds herself in a hotel in our city, sharing a room with an Eritrean lady who speaks very little English, but somehow has heard that the church to go to is CLM. I don't know how this happens. Now, the Eritrean lady doesn't come because she can't speak English. We need to work on our translation services, right? But the, the Iranian young lady, I don't know, she might be here or might be in the next service. Pardon? She's online today. She came and she was blown away for the first time in her life to be in a gathering like this. The most she'd gathered with was in a home with other believers. Can you imagine being in a setting like this for the first time? It was so beautiful to talk to her at the end of the service. But I want to tell you, in the great nation of Iran, God is on the move. And He will not be stopped. The church is growing and it is advancing. He's building His church and the gates of hell will not prevail. God's heart is for all nations. And it means us reaching those around us. Yes, our Jerusalem, our Judea, our families, the places where we work and where we study. It also means us going further afield to our Samaria, to the ends of the earth, for some of us. But it's also worth remembering that the ends of the earth are coming to us. Coventry is becoming increasingly ethnically diverse every year. Get this, I'm nearly done, but in 2001 in the census, 78% of the Coventry population was white British, 78%. Ten years later, 2011, that number had gone down from 78% to 67%. And in 2021, that number was 55%. And among the changes, more and more people, including from unreached nations, are coming to us. According to Operation World, an unreached people means a people group with less than 2% Christian, where it's very hard for, for that remnant to break out and reach. And for many, many of those people groups or nations, the, the percentage is way less than 2%. And there are 20 such people groups here in Coventry right now. A remarkable development if you think about it, which could be part of God's plan to reach all nations. That right on our doorstep, people we might bump into in Broadgate, or you might sit next to in the office, they might be from an unreached people where we cannot send a missionary, but we can reach them and their friends and family and context are inside that so-called unreached nation. God is on the move. It is still upon us to go into all the world and make disciples. But also all the world has come to us. We need to lift up our heads. My brothers and sisters, it's always been all nations. In eternity, we will be gathered with that glorious throng, we will be a part of it. The multitude from across the earth, as the Bible puts it, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. My brothers, my sisters, let's move towards heaven on earth. The kingdom coming now. Let's delight the Father's heart. Let's fulfill the great commission. And let's live in His commanded blessing. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Can we stand together? I wonder as the band come and join us, if you could find one other person near you and just take a moment to pray. If, if, you're, if you're a visitor here, you're not familiar with, with prayer, get, get in a three or a, or a four and just listen. But if we know how to pray, can we gather with, with one or at the most two other people? And, and can I ask us to, to pray for two things? Maybe one of you could pray for unity here among us at CLM and someone else to pray for God to move in the nations of the earth. Why don't you find someone right now? Let's dive in. We're only going to take two at the most three minutes to do this. If you're joining us online today, I wonder if you could maybe join with somebody that you're with if you're with somebody. And if you're by yourself, let, let me be your prayer partner here this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your 
incredible grace. We thank you for the privilege, Lord, of, of making us part of a family of nations. Mighty God, and I, I pray for my brothers and my sisters, even joining online today, and I pray for a heart connection in the Spirit. Even though we're not in the room and we can't join hands, I pray, Lord, that let our hearts be joined. Let unity flow. And God, we pray, almighty God, would you continue to bring your kingdom in the earth? Would you cause your church to expand? We pray, Lord, for the persecuted nations of the earth where, where the church is hidden underground. Let it, let it grow like wildfire. Protect all our brothers and sisters that face persecution. We pray, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done for the honor and glory of your holy name. Amen.